Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for this Sunday where we can come to worship you, Lord. Um, we pray that um, as we enter into this time of service that we can just focus on you, Lord. Um, bless your name. Not get distracted by um, all the other things that are happening in the world, Lord, um, and just focus on you. Lord, we just pray for the circumstances of the world, Lord, that um, you may heal the world, that um, your love for us um, allows us to just love um, everyone around us, Lord, and just spread that love in a time where we re everyone really needs it, Lord. We pray all this in your son's most precious name. Amen. Now we're going to move into the time of worship. You can't take our song away. Fear, you can't take our song away. Fear, you can't take our song away. Let's sing a little louder than we've ever sung before. Let's see a little clearer than we've ever seen before. Let's fly a little higher than we've ever been before. There's heights and depths and lengths and breadths of His love to discover today. I won't give this moment away I'm gonna worship you with all my heart and soul I won't give this moment away I'm gonna give you all my
So that's the worship for today. Now we're going to move into a time of scripture. So um, today, Brandon is going to be reading scripture for us. So uh, whenever you're ready, Brandon, you can begin. Jonah, Jonah chapter 4, uh, Jonah's anger to the Lord's compassion. But to the Lord this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said? For when I was still at home, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger, abandoning in love, abundant in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? So, Jonah had got out of out and sat down at the place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for him to ease his discomfort and Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah says so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, It is right for you to be angry. Uh, is it right to for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I am so angry. I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, thought you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right, and le right hand and their le left, and also many animals. Thank you, Brendan, for um, your scripture reading. Now, um, Pastor David is going to give a sermon. Thank you, Brandon. You're ready. For um, this is the first time Brandon has been um, been reading scripture, uh, reading scripture at Sunday service, and I thank him for doing such an awesome job. Um, I want um, I want to sh I kind of uh, share with you from Jonah chapter four again, um, because I think this is an important passage for all of us, um, especially during this time. I'm reading from Jonah chapter four, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate slow to anger and banding love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter set in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, 
God provided a scorching east wind, and the, bl the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah replied, it is. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have concern about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. I think this passage is relevant to us. We live in a historic time in a global pandemic where every, pretty much every country in this world is engulfed and dealing in some shape or form with this virus. We're all in a sense, never in human history has all of humankind been in the same boat. And this is, and yet this is where we find ourselves. Some have taken to really placing blame. Some have asked that it's China's fault and those who are Asian and those who are Chinese, that's, it's their fault. Others have responded and, and said, well, it's America's fault. It's Italy's fault. It's France's fault. But the question is, is this a time to be finding fault or is this a time to be finding solutions? Indeed, if when the history of this pandemic is written, we have to ask ourselves, is the title of that history going to be, be who was to blame? Or should it be another title? Jonah chapter four, the, the book of Jonah, I think a lot of us have, maybe you guys are familiar with the book of Jonah from Sunday school. Jonah is a prophet and he's called by God to go and prophesy to the Ninevites and ask them to repent or otherwise their city will be destroyed. The history of the Ninevites is they are enemies of the Jews and Jonah did not want to go to the enemy to save them. And so he ran and he ran and got on a ship, ship in the opposite, going the opposite direction, except God created a storm and the sailors were obviously, it was a huge storm. They thought they were going to die. And Jonah knew exactly where the storm was coming from. And he said, throw me overboard. He had to convince the sailors who didn't want to do throw him overboard, but he convinced them to throw him overboard. And at that point, God sent a giant fish to swallow Jonah. And there Jonah stayed in the belly of the fish for a period of time until he was spat out on the shores of where else but Nineveh, <clears throat> the place that he was called to go. And the word of the Lord came to him again a second time and told him, go and prophesy and give them the message that I gave you originally, which is calling them to repent and turn to the Lord. So Jonah knew that there, he had no choice, and so he went to the city of Nineveh and could just picture it, an extremely reluctant and cranky prophet who doesn't want to do it. So he probably goes to Nineveh, does the minimum amount of work he needs to do, and says, you need to repent or God's going to destroy your city. To his surprise, the Ninevites repent. And so <clears throat> where we find ourselves is what happens is Jonah decides to camp out outside of the city because he really wants to see what's going to happen. I believe he's hoping that God will not keep his promise and end up destroying the Ninevites. And he's kind of looking forward to seeing that happen. Because yet again, the Ninevites are the enemies of the Israelites. <clears throat> so he camps out. And this passage, uh, chapter 4, tells us he, he makes a shelter. Um, and a plant grows up beside him to provide shade. 
that the plant soon dies. And so Jonah is extremely upset because he knew God did it to him again, and he's upset, and he's angry with God, and so he ends up having this kind of dialogue between him and God. <clears throat> There's a few things we see from this, this story. One is, despite Jonah's rebellion, God is always looking out for him and always protecting him. He's, he protected him from the ocean, the sea, by providing the fish, and he protected him from the sun by providing this plant. And what do the ocean and the sun represent? Well, ocean represents water and the sun represents fire. And those are the two elements of God's judgment and destruction. We see in Genesis, God sends a great flood to destroy humanity, but rest protects Jonah and his family, as well as the animals in the ark. And after that, he promised, and the symbol of his promise was a rainbow, that he will never destroy the, water by, uh, the world by water again. But we know from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, that he will destroy the world eventually, but this time by fire and not by water. So fire and water are symbols of God's judgment. But regardless, we see in Jonah that God protects his people from the calamity of his judgment. And that's because God is not only reading from Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, he's not only gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love to the Ninevites, but also to Jonah, who's extremely rebellious. <clears throat> the second thing that we see is even though he's gracious, he's compassionate, he's slow to anger and abounding in love, God does not let Jonah off the hook because he has a calling on Jonah. And his calling on Jonah is to go to the Ninevites and deliver the message. But the interesting thing is Jonah resists, but God through the fish brings him back to his original calling. And through the death of the plant brings him back to a communion with God. Jonah doesn't want anything to do with God because he knows what God wants to do and he doesn't want any part of it. And that shows God's love and unrelenting love for Jonah and his people. Now we're asking probably, well, what does that have to do with me? What does Jonah's calling have to do with me? It has everything, everything to do with us as Christians because we are called. Believe it or not, if you're a Christian, you're called. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. That's a call. That was the call to the first Christians, Peter and Andrew. And he called them, and what was his calling for them? To follow him. What was God's calling for Jonah? To follow him. And to do what? To serve him. But how do, do we serve him but to serve people and serve others? So our first call, our calling, just like the calling of Jonah, is to serve God by serving others. Love God by loving others. And so during this crisis, what should it drive us to? It should drive us to loving God and loving others. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may mature and complete, not lacking anything. We're in trial. I know we know people, we have loved ones, people who we care about, who are sick. 
who are dealing with this virus in a real way. But what should those trials drive us to? What should the trials of Jonah drive him to? But a closer relationship with God and for us to return to our first love, to our calling of loving God and loving others. Why did Jonah run? Because he knew God's basic character, that he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he didn't want any part of that because just like the other people who are going around hating and being bitter and placing blame on other people, saying it's a Chinese virus or an American virus or an Italian virus, going around blaming other people, Jonah did not want any part of being gracious and compassionate. He doesn't want to be abounding in love. But because he's a prophet, because he's one of God's own, God pursues him. And ultimately, what does God want from Jonah? To prophesy to the Ninevites? Yes. But ultimately, he wants Jonah to understand his heart. The Bible said it was credited to David that he was a man after God's own heart. And that's what jo and that's what God was doing. God was revealing His heart. He was revealing His heart to Jonah. And we find that in verse ten and eleven. You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. People are concerned. They're concerned about Netflix and their internet. People are concerned about toilet paper. People are concerned if, they get, if they're going to get their coffee. They haven't really contributed to its production, but they're concerned. But God's asking us to be concerned about human beings. God is calling us to be concerned about human life, something much greater. And he's revealing his heart to us as he's revealing his heart to Jonah when he said, and should I not have concern, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. And if he's concerned, my brothers and sisters, if he's concerned about 120,000 people and animals, shouldn't he be concerned about the billions of people around the world, the lives who are struggling in the midst of this pandemic? And you know, we, we see it on the news, leaders and medical experts, people with degrees, multiple letters attached to after their names, who just a year ago were masters of the universe, who knew everything about everything, now are completely confused and dumbfounded. They are truly like the Ninevites. They don't know their left hand from their right hand. They're panicky. They're afraid. They are not the masters of the universe anymore. They're not even the masters of this tiny, tiny virus. They don't know what to do. Whether they're honest with you or not, they do not know what to do. Wear a face mask, don't wear a face mask, nobody knows. But God has compassion on them. God has compassion on us because that's his basic character. He's a loving God and that's the heart. That's the heart he wants to reveal to us. That's the heart that he revealed to Jonah. We live in a world where even before, even Christians are taking sides.
no country, no side is willing to back down, let alone have compassion on other people. Is that us? Is that God's calling on his people to take sides, to join the people who are placing blame? A couple of weeks ago, maybe a week ago, there was news about an Asian family. They're not Chinese, but an Asian family, it says. We were shopping in a, a Sam's Club, a Walmart wholesale store. A mom and dad with their six-year-old and two-year-old. And a man who was out for blood, who was blaming the virus on Chinese people, decided he was going to go out with a knife. He was going to go out there with a knife and try to kill some Chinese people. He stabbed the parents. His fury and his crazed anger would would not even have mercy on the six-year-old and the two-year-old. He stabbed them too. And a Sam's Club employee saw what was happening, rushed to their defense, also got stabbed and wounded. Afterwards, when he was arrested, this this knife-wielding criminal said he wanted, his goal was to kill Chinese people because he blamed the virus on them. The irony is he stabbed it. The couple and this family weren't even Chinese, but does it really matter? How is that going to, number one, how is that a solution for the pandemic? By killing people first before the virus does? What is the solution? In 2008 Olympics, there was a, the motto of the Beijing Olympics was one world, one dream. It was a symbol of unity. And I believe no, in no other time in human history, in no other time in human history, have all humans around the world, all peoples around the world been more you more united by a common enemy, by a common threat to their very life, which is this COVID-19 coronavirus. And that should serve to unite us because we are one world and we have one dream. And that dream is that we can live without shelter and place orders. We can go back to normal lives. Churches can resume service in person without fear of someone being infected and possibly dying. That is our one dream and one world. What, but in the midst of this dark times, despite this unifying aspect, we see the world more divided. In the midst of this dark time, where, what role should Christians play? I've been asking myself that the same question. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a medical professional, I'm not a politician. I don't have the resources or authority to do much. And to be honest, I've, I've been feeling kind of useless But in prayer and petition, God has reminded me, and I hope it reminds all of us of our original calling, which is to love God and love others. In our own little way, we can show, we can shine forth God's light. Some people are taking to blaming the city. Some people don't want to be in the city. Some people are, even some Christians are calling it God's judgment on the city. You know, I I generally take, stand by these principles when calamities happen. One, I am not God. And two, God can speak for himself. Brothers and sisters, it is not a time to start judging others. 
It is not a time to start taking the judgment seat from God and saying, start pronouncing judgment, because that's exactly what Jonah wanted. Jonah wanted God's judgment. He couldn't kill the Ninevites, so he wanted God to kill them, kill him, kill them for him, because they were his enemies. That's human instinct. That comes from the flesh. That is not a godly character. That's why Jesus said, said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, to the Pharisees, he says, For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Our calling is not to start judging. Our calling is to start loving. Our calling is to follow God by serving others. God can take care of the judgment because he said, in he, and that's what he said in, in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. It is God, the judgment seat is God's, not ours. But what we can do is to follow God's basic character which is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. On their wedding day, many couples who choose the traditional vows would hold each other's hands and say these words, I take you to be my wedded wife or husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love to, and to cherish, till death do us part according to God's holy ordinance. And there too, I pledge you, my pledge myself to you. I pledge myself to you. The Bible says Christ is a, is a groom, the church is the bride, and I believe that is the same vows. We, we get, derive inspiration for those traditional wedding vows from the vow that God makes to his people and his people make to him. That in all circumstances, God will look out, will love us, and in all circumstances, we will love God. But we love God by loving others. Jesus was asked once, what were the two greatest commandments? What was the greatest commandment? And he gave them two, which I believe are two halves of the same coin. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's our calling. That's what we can do. In our own little way, we can do that. Recently, I heard of a Christian, the Christian organization, Samaritan's Purse. They were in Italy setting up a field hospital, helping to treat the sick from coronavirus. And they recently set up an association with Mount Sinai Hospital, set up a field hospital in Central Park, treating the sick. And what an image. A Christian organization teaming up with a Jewish hospital to set up a field hospital in the middle of New York City, Central Park. See, they didn't have time for judgment. They didn't have time to look for blame and ask, who do I blame for this situation? They were interest, more interested in saving lives and finding solutions. Serving God by serving others, loving God by loving others. They immediately set up a tent, a field hospital in Central Park. Now you hear some voices, like the mayor of New York City saying, and other politicians in New York City saying, well, we don't know, if, we're gonna keep a close eye on them because we don't know if they're, they're, they're gonna be treating people according to New York values. We don't know if they're gonna only treat those who uh, who are born again Christians? They don't. These are people. But you know what? These are people who don't know their left hand from their right hand. 
these politicians, the, city, the mayor of the city of New York and others. Left hand, right hand, they don't know. We don't have to pay attention to that and we don't have to live according to those rules. I applaud, I think Samaritan's Purse gives us this example, Samaritan's Purse gives us a perfect example of what Christians should be doing, which is serving God by serving others, loving God by loving others, regardless if those others um, deserve to be loved in our estimation or not. Certainly by Jonah's estimation, the Ninevites do not, did not deserve to be loved. And yet in God's eyes, they should be loved and they must be loved. And I believe the church can be a beacon of hope, a beacon of God's light in the midst of this darkness. And I think organizations like Samaritan's Purse, but countless of other nameless Christians are shining forth God's light in the midst of this pandemic. Whether or not people will acknowledge them, whether people are going to hold them suspect is not relevant. Whether the mayor of New York City or other politicians who don't, who used to be the masters of the universe, but now don't know their left from their right and just as panicky as panicky can get, giving contradictory advice in the course of an hour, whether they acknowledge that is irrelevant because this is what Jesus said. And I leave this with you guys. You are, who's you? You, me, Christians. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. We believers are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And that's our responsibility. That is our calling, to shine forth God's light of love, of forgiveness, of healing, of hope. That's always going to produce a reaction from the kingdom of darkness, but that is not our concern. Our concern is to follow God into serving and loving others. And that is, that is our calling. And I think if we follow closely our calling, we will be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are and what this day represents because we know this is the day that you commemorate, the day that you entered Jerusalem and people were singing Hosanna to you, the same people who later would call out to crucify you. Jesus, we know that you love the city so much that you were willing to go into the city Jerusalem to share the gospel at the risk of your life. And we thank you for organizations like Samaritan's Purse and other, countless other Christians who are risking their lives to love you by loving others, serve you by serving others. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that sermon, Pastor David. Now we're going to move into a time of uh, response. So just please follow along. Fear you can't take our soul away. Fear you can't take our soul away. Let's sing a little louder than we've ever sung before. Let's see a little clearer than we've ever seen before. Let's fly a little higher than we've ever been before. There's heights and depths and lengths and breadths of his love to discover today. I won't give this moment away. I'm going to worship you with all my heart and soul. I won't give this moment away. I'm going to give you all.
Um, now we're going to move into time of communion. So Pastor David will lead, lead communion. We're going to move into a time of communion, as Alan said, and um, I want to give everybody an opportunity to um, kind of prepare get bread and some fruit juice um, so you can participate in this communion. Uh, some might be asking, well, do, do we only need, I don't have, maybe I don't have grape juice and I don't have matzo bread. And so um, uh, how can I do communion? Well, uh, we know from the Bible that whatever Jesus had, Jesus used as symbols. He used the bread, the matzo bread, the unleavened bread and uh, the wine as symbols of his sacrifice for us. And so that's, that's something to, that's important to remember that those were symbolic. The main point of communion is to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So I want to give uh, right now, I'm going to read the passage that talks about this, but as I read, I give you guys an opportunity, if you haven't done so already, to get some fruit juice and uh, some bread uh, to participate in this communion. Okay. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 25. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread He took bread and he broke it. He took bread and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So brothers and sisters, this represents Christ's body that was sacrificed for us. And this bread represents his body. Let us take it and remember his sacrifice. Let's take it together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do, di do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the, wine, uh, the, the juice, the wine together in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. Let's pray. Father God, in the midst of this pandemic, we pray that we will remember your sacrifice, your body broken for us, your blood shed for us. And we pray that it drives us closer to you and closer to your calling for us to love you, to serve you by loving and serving others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor David. Uh, now we're going to move into time of uh, benediction. Sorry. Okay, let's all receive the Lord's blessing together. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord deal kindly and graciously with you. The Lord bestow his favor upon you and grant you peace. God bless. Thank you. And um, now we're going to move into a topic of announcements. So these are the servers for this week. Uh, again, thank you, Brandon, for your first time serving and reading scripture reading. Um, just a reminder, there is prayer meeting on Wednesday nights from 9 to 10 p.m.
please join us as we spend the time praying for our brothers and sisters and the and the issues in this world. Uh, but just another reminder: we have a Good Friday service this Friday um, at eight p.m. to nine thirty p.m. and Easter Sunday service from ten a.m. to twelve p.m. Um, uh, in the following slides, I would I will give you the instructions of how to join. So first, any announcements? Is there any new first-time guests today? Okay. Um, offering is on the website in this link, gcbcny.org slash give. So there's different options of how to uh, provide offering. So if you feel obligated or uh, called to, call to offer, please uh, do so through this link. So for Good Friday service, it would be through the Chinese service link um, on the website. So joining the English service, you usually press the English side. So just make sure you press the Chinese service link um, at 8 p.m. this Friday. If you're entering by your phone um, or searching for the Zoom ID room, you have to enter the password 8022. If you're clicking the link on the website, you won't have to enter the password. And um, all future events will be on uh, gcbcny.org slash events. It's just part of our new website, so please click there for any future events. Um, and same thing for Easter service. It's going to be using the Chinese service link uh, uh, on Sunday. So remember to press the Chinese service and not the English service link. So 40-day fasting. This is um, something we're going to try to do um, and start on April 18th after um, Easter Sunday. So that'll be the Monday after um, tomorrow, the week, the Monday, the week after tomorrow. Um, and there's a 40 day fasting um, and each participant it will choose to sacrifice one meal per day. It can be breakfast, lunch or dinner, whichever one you want. Um, and just to remind you to continue with this fasting only if you're physically able. So if you're feeling sick to so please stop. Um, if you're feeling unwell in any way, to please stop. And also to remember to keep hydrated, drink plenty of water, take vitamins, um, and just remember to keep yourself safe if you decide to fast. And the purpose of this fast is to um, pray for God's deliverance from this pandemic and pray for God's direction for this church during this time and moving forward. Um, as we have announced in the past, so, uh, ministries have moved online. So if you're part of the youth group, please reach out to Herman. Or if you want to participate in the youth group, please reach out to Herman. Um, and there will be youth group online on Fridays at 7.30. Uh, if you want to participate in college group or have any questions about college uh, fellowship, please reach out to Jackie at that number. Um, and again, it's also on Fridays at 7.30. Also, if you want to just uh, look for any information, it's all on the website and under the Youth and College tab, respectively. And if you have um, if you have any questions about prayer meeting, which again is on Wednesdays at 9 p.m., please reach out to me. And it's uh, more information is also on the website. So the prayer list for the church is to uh, pray first. Pray for the online technologies and tools that we're using for service uh, for prayer. Um, and for multiple ministries, as well as the community and for people of faith and those who yearn to um, have faith. So just continue keeping that in your prayer. Um, just pray to use every opportunity and to serve your community and to serve God to the best of your ability during this time and for the church to come out this pandemic as a more mature church. Um, for servers and volunteers to grow in spirit and be blessed even in this time where um, it's not the traditional ways of serving. Um, and also just pray for the sick. So for Cameron's father, he's um, currently um, sick with the virus. So just please pray for his health um, and pray for Cameron's family during this uh, hard time. And also for Paul, uh, Ronald and Rachel's father, that he's also not feeling well and feeling sick. So just pray for him and the family during this time. Um, so after this moment of silent prayer, this, that'll be the end of service. Thank you. <laughs>